entire text. My name's Joe, and I'm an alcoholic. Can you hear that in the back? That's good. I'm have a great mixture of emotions about standing here tonight. Uh, first, I better explain what a mixture of emotions is. That's a, that's what I was going to try this out with that microphone. Mixture of emotions is when a fellow's 14-year-old daughter comes home at 3 o'clock in the morning with a Gideon Bible under her arm. <laughs> I got to tell you this, it, I, I think it's priceless, it may offend your last night's speaker. I was going across the lobby over there today and a little lady came toddling along and tugged at my cuffs and said, I sure did enjoy your talk last night. <laughs> I don't know who, who gets the compliment there, but I feel like I'm getting up here for the second time tonight. I don't know, I, uh, uh, I'm an old member in AA. I've been around for AA for a long time. You can tell by looking at me, I've been somewhere for a long time. <laughs> and at the expense of sounding sarcastic, most of the old AA members I know are a pain in the ass. <laughs> I like to feel that I'm an exception to that rule. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and if any of you newcomers feeling like that, looking at the old guys in AA, don't do it. This society is fresh and it's new. And it was started by a guy six months sober and another one that had only been sober for two days. And it has been laughingly said that the progress that has been made in the early days of Alcoholics Anonymous was due to the fact that there wasn't any old members around. <laughs> so I'm terribly grateful for being an old member but there is a price on it. When I was a new man one night at the club, I was washing the cups, and some older fella come and put his arm around me, and he said, young man, you've got a good attitude. I like the way you're working, and said, you're going to go a long way in AA. And I beamed at him. Twenty-five years later, I picked up the same dirty cups and started washing them, and a young man was heard to say, look at the old bastard, he's still trying to run this out there. <laughs> I don't know, I think to relax, uh, one of the funniest stories years ago, and most of you will know this. It shows the weird way that an alcoholic accepts things. If you remember the old comedian Jack Benny, who was one of the greatest as far as I was concerned, and his straight man who was an old gal named Mary Livingston, and he loved to play the violin. And somebody had given him a dog as a gift. And he was trying to practice the violin. And uh, every time he started playing, the damn dog howled. And would play right, sing right along with him. And it upset him something terrible. And he finally said to Mary Livingston, what the hell am I going to do about the dog screaming when I'm playing the violin? And she quickly said, why don't you play something that he don't know?
We have the first of many coming messages. Don Reynolds, I believe, in this badly written note from Edna, call 837-5060 as soon as possible. Tell me that. One of the amazing things about the illness alcohol is it alcoholism is that this is the only disease on the face of the earth where the newcomer apologizes for not having it longer. <laughs> and uh, is it? everybody wants to be an old member and hey, right away, you know. To satisfy the whim of an old man, could I see the hands of Everybody who's less than six months sober are those people making their first conference. Would you do me that favor at this convention? Look here. Hold them up. I got a secret for you. You're the ones we're throwing this damn thing for. <laughs> This is your party, and if there's anything has been said up here, or will be said tonight, it's in your direction. Because you're embarking upon probably the greatest adventure of your whole existence, believe me. I don't know, it's gotten very fashionable in the last few years. Have you noticed that? Uh, all over, we're, everybody wants to get in on the act. Uh, I've just come back from Hollywood where they're uh, writing the script for next year's soap operas. Did any of you girls watch, I know you do, those fuss and screw shows? <laughs> and they're putting uh, alcoholics into the plot now. We've replaced uh, two bad ovaries and one homosexual out there. <laughs> Very fashionable. Everybody likes to treat it. The reason they like to treat alcoholism is because you don't have to show any results. <laughs> it's that simple. But for those of you who would not delude yourself, there is still somewhat of a stigma on this disease. No family likes to admit they've got one of us yet. And it's just that way. I'll prove it to you. I got a nephew. No, my wife's got a nephew. He's not mine. <laughs> my wife's got a nephew in Dallas that's a psychiatrist. And she's got another nephew in San Francisco that's a homosexual. And my people brag on them more than they do on me, and I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> If, if you're coming to AA to make any points, forget it. It's not become bridge table gossip yet, you know. This thing called alcoholism, we delude ourselves about that. I never have been to a seminar that discussed the keen alcoholic mind yet. But, you know, that's where all the killer cliches come from. I got an idea that cliches are devised to make disaster more palatable. But if a drunk says something for three days in a row and nobody argues with him, it becomes a law. <laughs> it's that way. Years ago, the kids that have come in Alcoholics Anonymous in the 60s, this newer generation that we old-timers have to contend with, 
They have a hang-up, and they talk about it all the time. They say, we have to identify. That's one of the big hang-ups with the kids out of the 60s. Years ago in general service, and I think they still have it, they put out a pamphlet called 44 Questions. And they were rather innocuous little questions. They didn't have a hell of a lot to do with my type of alcoholism. You know, little mild questions. Did your wife give you that look today? <coughs> or did you gargle with too much laboris or something like that? Now I have devised out of my own sheer brilliance some questions and I'll bet you it'll take less than 44 of them to identify. You want to try it? Have you ever had the roof of your mouth sunburn? Have you ever been arrested while in jail? <laughs> Have you ever been run over by your own car while driving in? <laughs> Have you ever woke up in bed in the morning with a circus midget? Did you hear about that midget that uh, got thrown out of the nudist colony because he was going around getting his nose in everybody's business? done the Tennessee waltz in a straight jacket. <laughs> I think we're identifying here for some reason. We got one more question and this will separate the men from the boys. You can't say that in Hollywood. They do it with a broomstick out there. <laughs> okay. Have you ever woke up in the morning feeling rather delicately with the brown whimpers and lose your glasses and wash your teeth with preparation aid? <laughs> I'll give you a pucker. Bill talked about it in the book Alcoholics Anonymous. Those are questions that come from alcoholics of our type. And I think we can identify out here tonight and with things like that. I don't know how to... Everybody wants to find out why they drank or they want to... We spend a lot of time now describing alcoholism, don't we? They labor with the misapprehension that if we can just describe it well enough, the damn drunk will quit drinking. And he just refuses to do it. They print pamphlets and, <clears throat> and uh, make films and have seminars. And if you ever notice that all the people that are reading the pamphlets and seeing the films and having the seminars are sober, The drunk is out there <laughs> in his natural habitat. And if you would approach him, you are ultimately going to have to visit him in his natural habitat. It's pretty simple to me that way. I don't know, I didn't want to be an alcoholic. I didn't set out to be one. I 
when I discovered I had a lot of problems, I did everything I could. I tried uh, tried psychiatry, and I found out that psychiatry is the art of picking the pocket through the scalp. <laughs> and I read everything I could find, old Sigmund Freud, Freud. Everything that he, I became an authority on Sigmund Freud, could quote him line for line. And I found out he stole all of it out of Macbeth. <laughs> but I let him go for one thing. I found out he didn't have any willpower. I have gotten a use for people that don't have a lot of willpower. He couldn't quit smoking. So I left Freud and I left him. I tried religion. And this is a great misconception. AA is not a religion. Sometimes I wished it were, you know. I wouldn't have to work those damn steps. <laughs> and then I could shout and promise my way into sobriety. <laughs> then I tried some of the mystic phenomena tried yoga, deep meditation, plum out, and I got to the part where you stand on your head and all of my pills fell out of my pocket. <laughs> I really don't know how to describe an alcoholic. I can, let's go in the back door. I can tell you what an alcoholic is not. I can do that. A few months back, I was going out to Las Vegas to hold services. <laughs> and uh, there was a fellow got on the plane and sit in the center seat, and I'm in the aisle, I'm on the window. He's got me hemmed in. And he did the damnedest thing. Let me tell you what he did. When the stewardess started hustling the booze, he ordered one of those big, delightful, brown, frosted things. God damn, ain't he perfect. <laughs> and I'm sitting over next to the window, dying. And do you know what he did? He set that drink on his tray and begin to read. <laughs> and I like to went out of my mind. <laughs> God Almighty, drink it. What did you order it for, for God's sake? <laughs> A little sip. And do you know when the stewardess picked up that drink to serve dinner, part of it was left? Now, the difference is this. She said, Mr. Lee, would you like to have a drink? And I said, no, ma'am. And she said, well, why not? And I said, because I've got to be home in February. <laughs> I started drinking when I was 17 years old, purely and simply to be accepted in a group of young fellows. And I remember that drink as vividly as though it were yesterday. And one of the secrets of the developing alcoholic is this. We don't worry about what alcohol does to people. Alcohol does the very same thing to all people. We worry about what that drink does for him. That's our difference. And that drink did something for me that night that it evidently didn't do for those other kids that were along. And I did something that I continued to do for the next 19 and a half years. It was only a few short moments 
that it lasted a very short time. But I remembered it. Then I did the thing that I was very, you know, good about doing, and that was throwing up and passing out. I threw up and passed out with my first drink, and if I remember correctly, with my last one. I could stand here and give you a dissertation on puking <laughs> all of the way from uh, spray puking to project of puking and everything in between. But that night, that drink did something for me that I didn't have in me and it made me feel differently. It made me feel, and this word is in our book, made me feel whole, made me feel a part of instead of a part from. And I knew about that. For this few short minutes of euphoria, I couldn't get it out of my head. And I started going back to it again and again and again. Wasn't compulsive. I did, and this is the only place where you can properly use this word. I began to use alcohol. Filled a void in my life. Took me away from the wall. And with that first drink, there came two great things to me. Sophistication and intellectuality. Instantly. And the little East Texas town I lived in became too small for me. Alcohol made me an instant genius. And I moved on. And this is the story of alcoholics before the advent of this society. This has been the story of the treatment of the alcoholic until the advent of this society. And that's keep him moving, keep him moving. That was the treatment. But I ended up, of all places, and you're going to not believe this, in Hollywood, California, a young East Texas clod. And I went into, and I hate to use this word, one of the queerest professions that you could possibly think of. I became an understudy to one of the more eminent designers of ladies' lingerie. <laughs> it's a field day for a drunk. And this is where you cut those soft, silk, sleazy, intimate things that the ladies wear. It's a fine profession. And I went a good piece in a hurry, became rather a known figure for a very short time. It was very short-lived. We have a step in Alcoholics Anonymous. I believe it is the second step where it infers that you might have a gopher in the garden. <laughs> if you cut a bunch of braziers with three of those places in them, you're nuts. You know? <laughs> I told a psychiatrist about that, and he said it was just wishful thinking. You know? <laughs> Needless to say, I blew the first opportunity. And I shall let my ego float around a little bit here. It was a wonderful opportunity. If any of you are old enough to remember, I put the first pair of slacks on a gal called Marlena Dietrich in the year 1938 and started a trend that I see right here tonight. It's still with us all over the place. And they said I would go far, but they didn't really know how far I really would go. <laughs> and uh, I had been taken in by a kind Jewish fellow, a very lovely man, a non-alcoholic, one of my first employers who could never understand why we get up in the morning and set out to destroy ourselves. He just couldn't understand it. And he came to me one morning and said these words that an alcoholic cannot stand to hear. You 
can't drink. Alcoholic cannot stand you can't. He cannot stand don't do that. I was very recently talking up in the University of Illinois in a place about like this in a dining hall. And I was talking right along. And I looked over on the wall and there's a big sign over there. It had a big capital don't. And I'd talk a little while and my head go right back over to the don't. <laughs> and it said, don't take the dishes out of this hall. I've got two of them damn dishes at home now. <laughs> And they have absolutely no collectible value. <laughs> they said to me, don't take the dishes. He said to me, you can't drink. And I set out to prove that I could and prove that I couldn't. And he was a rather whimsical Jewish fellow. He came to me one morning, good morning, Joe. You're fired. <laughs> Brevity was a thing with him. And then he said something that puzzled me. He said, there's always some good comes out of everything, I believe. And I thought, here we go again. And he said, well, the way you handle those scissors, if you'd have been a rabbi, you would have destroyed our whole race. <laughs> This is the blow, this is the first humiliation, the first indignity, the first, and I like this word, hurt, that the alcoholic has to become accustomed to, never understanding, never finding him an answer. And this is where he begins to start looking for a why and a because. How come did he get fired, Joe? No why? No, because. This is where he begins to lay in the pillow at night and devise dialogue to answer these questions that society heaps upon him. None of his answers ever quite satisfying him. And for however how far he has to go in search of a why and a because. The war was going on then, and... I went down to the shipyard and bought a plumber's license out the back door of a union hall and went into the shipyard as a master plumber. Here's a fellow who never picked up anything any heavier than a pair of scissors, and you well know I was a fraud. And those were the days when you were frozen to your job. Do you remember that? What are they saying to me? They're saying, you can't quit, they're saying. I have a pink document that hangs in my den today, and it's signed by the United States Department of War Labor, and it prohibits me from working within 25 miles of the city of Los Angeles. <laughs> Now, we get into another routine that goes with alcoholism. We're becoming uncomfortable with all of our immediate surroundings. Did any of you ever hear these plaintive words to the al -Anon, Honey, let's go somewhere else where we don't know anyone. What we're saying is where nobody knows us, really, you know. So we start a journey that keeps us on the run until we choose one of the alternatives that the alcoholic has, our finest society. And I've heard Bill say it out of his own mouth, and those alternatives weren't sweet. We either go mad or die. Heard him say it a lot of times. So we move on. Went to Sacramento from Los Angeles. 
And the thing that puzzles me, the theory of moving a drunk from one place to the other has no value at all in the recovery of alcoholism because when you get up there, he's there too. It's just that simple. Now I hear people get up behind this podium in our local groups and tell about the sad things. Ooh, that damn pelican is biting at me. You know? <laughs> Wasn't that good chicken? <laughs> Fricassee of pelican. <laughs> what else can you do to a chicken? We hear guys get up behind a podium here and tell of the sad things that have befallen them. And sometimes in our AA meetings it gets rather competitive, you know. The last fella always wins. I can win that contest without any problem. When we moved from Los Angeles to Sacramento, I was run over with a welcome wagon. <laughs> I imagine, remember how embarrassed that woman was with me laying half under and half out and she was trying to give me some tickets to the car wash. <laughs> I had to, had to wash her car. I didn't have any, you know, like that. Another little attribute of this story of the alcoholic as he moves along, it seems to me that his choices of things to do becomes less and less and less and we take the next best thing and the next best thing and tomorrow it's going to be better we say we're the dumbest people on earth we get up every day and do the same thing and expect a different result out of it you know and if you do the same thing as long as I did the same thing going to happen to you every day Tomorrow it's going to be better. I went to work for the railroad. Now, man, I'll tell you something. And they are the most narrow-minded group of people that I've ever come in contact with. They don't have any compassion for their employees at all. They have a rule about drinking. Hey, that mouth of the conference is a railroad man. Indeed. It reads, this rule does, if you're seen coming out of a place that uh, dispenses alcoholic beverages, you can be fired. I was never seen coming out. <laughs> Very often. And if I came out, I was an unidentified flying officer. <laughs> now they have reason for having that rule. And the reason is this, that they run more than one train on the track. And I have never yet figured out just quite how they did it. And I've lived in horror. I've sit in the back of a fast-moving passenger train with a watch in my hand, doing the things that they told me to do, knowing that it would happen to me tomorrow lived in constant horror. Man, they sit on the back of one of those things going 90 miles an hour with a hangover is something else. Now the railroads, all oh, they work about like the government, they're about 20% efficient <laughs> in a good year. <laughs> and everything that they intend to do, they put a bulletin up about it maybe hanging on the back of the toilet or somewhere. Anything that they have that they want to talk about. The railroad company hangs a bullet. And we were pushing these trains over the Sierra, now maybe you follow this vernacular, this parlance, over the Sierra Nevada mountains going up to 7,000 feet in a few miles. Roughest piece of railroad in the world. And when we got to the top of the mountain, that we went into a thing called an interlocking system. I know you've heard of those. 
a beautiful system made by this ferry company in those days. It was run by lights all together. And it was uh, electronically attuned like nothing else was. And we'd get rid of our helpers up at the top of the mountain. Now the railroad had the colossal gall to hang a sign in the depot in Sacramento with reference to this interlocking system. You're going to like this sign. I know you're going to like it. They put a sign in there and it read like this. You're just going to go for this right away. It is physically impossible. That's enough to get any drunk statistics. It is physically impossible to make a mistake in that interlocking system. I used to walk a block out of the way to get to read that damn sign. <laughs> kind of kept me going, God of money. And at night in bed, I'd hear those words, physically impossible. You think. One night, I got two engines going towards one another. Between them were four cars, carrots, apples, lettuce, and celery, and I made the biggest goddamn Waldorf salad <laughs> in the history of mankind. <laughs> and you know the railroad was upset about that. <laughs> And I really don't think, now, that it was all of the equipment that was destroyed. I think it was the fact that I had screwed up their sign. <laughs> they kind of felt like they'd been had by a drunk, I think. The investigation, I had another alcoholic representing me, and he proved one of the most atrocious lies, about a million to one shot, that a Mexican was walking along there swinging a lantern and that I had mistaken that for a signal. <laughs> and he walked me out of there with 60 days, bad guy. Now the old superintendent, another non-alcoholic employee who could not understand the ridiculous antics of an alcoholic. And he was livid with rage when he came out of that investigation. He was a great big hulk of a man. He weighed 300 pounds. And he said to me, you ought to be arrested for even walking on our right of way. And then he said a thing to me that some of our dear al have been heard to say. I'll get you if it's the last thing I ever do. <laughs> Now, let me tell you, you don't have to get even with an alcoholic, to those who you don't understand. He's got something embedded in him that if left to his own devices, he'll get even with himself. And unless by some quirk of good fortune, that somebody takes the time to share with him. He'll have to die for having a promise that he don't even know he's God. Such is the nature of alcoholism as we see it again and again and again. And our co-founder well knew the intricacies of this terrible dilemma when he put in our book the alcoholic cannot remember the pain of even a week ago and he will repetitively go until he destroys himself well the railroads in those days they wouldn't admit that they had a drunk on their hands, a man who was responsible for the lives of a lot of people on their passenger trains, 
We didn't have any treatment for alcohol in those days. Then they sent me to the railroad hospital and put me in the nervous ward. Can you imagine that? Of course, of course, of course. <laughs> they wouldn't admit it. And there was my introduction to two things that I had never seen before. I was introduced to a delightful little dose that we don't hear much about anymore, and this is called sodium bromide elixir. This, for you girls who are old enough to remember, is the granddaddy of Nervine. You ever hear about Nervine? They used to say, hey, Minnie can't come out today. She's nervous. Hell, she was stoned. <laughs> It's a fine drink. Has a couple of side effects, cross your eyes and you'll froth at the mouth a little. But other than that, it's a delightful drink and food doesn't disturb it any. And it's just a hell of a fine drink. And then that was my introduction to psychiatry. I'd never had the psychiatry before. And uh, I would love to say here that the members of Alcoholics Anonymous are my acquaintance who have had their alcoholism beaten out of them through their knees with a rubber mallet and they're very scarce. But they brought in this uh, frustrated piano tuner <laughs> and he asked me a lot of very personal questions, real nasty questions. And, uh, oh, I don't know, like, did you ever wet the bed? And I know that's a result of drinking and not a cause of it, by God. <laughs> and I remember another question that he asked me. Did you ever suck your thumb? And I remember how pale he turned when I said to him, yes, sir, I still do. And I graphically described to him how I went off in the corner and took a quick pull at it every now and then, you know. <laughs> well, you can laugh if you want to. It relaxes me for my <laughs> sake. <laughs> different strokes for different folks, you know. I wasn't getting much therapy there. I was eating one grain peanut barbacol and drinking that delightful sodium bromide elixir. And we had a Mexican bringing port wine up the elevator shaft. <laughs> and letting them all run concurrently. That's a familiar word, isn't it? And I wasn't getting too much therapy. And I stayed in there three months and they threw me out. Psychiatrist came one day. I had been going around cheering up some patients. And, <laughs> and he threw me out. He said, you've got to get out and let some sick people come in here. Now, whenever I blew it, I did a thing. I know none of you guys ever did this. Every time I blew it from the time I was 17 until I'm, here I am now, 37 years old, I'd always go home to Mama. I had a delightful childhood. Lasted 37 years. You know. <laughs> Didn't want to go. Hated Tyler with a passion, for God's sake. It was a hick town for a guy like me. And I walked back to Tyler. Maybe it won't be so funny from here on in. Maybe we'll talk about some of the mechanics of the Society of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I went back home walking. Now here's the smart cat, the resourceful guy, the fellow from Hollywood and Beverly Hills, the coming genius, walking back to Texas. And it was just exactly the reverse of the story of the prodigal son. You know, they saw him coming from afar. 
and threw his butt in jail. This is what they made me. <laughs> My own mother had me thrown in there. And this is a terrible thing for a man of my high temperament, a man as delicately as tuned as I am. And I remember how bitterly I hated my own mother for having brought it down. What was my first cussing about it? And there I was. This is the end of the line. Or, as the old saying goes, it is the beginning of the end. I don't like that. Don't like that description at all. Okay. To me, when we beat our ultimate surrender, my friends, is the beginning of the beginning, not the beginning of the end. Mr. Jack, T-I-N-E-L, called for Mr. Jack, B-I-V-E-N, to call Holiday. <coughs> See if we can't get him in butches from now on. <laughs> I'm in the jail in this sad state. We're going to talk about AA now, the Society of Alcoholics Anonymous, and we'll talk about alcoholism and not alcohol -wasm. One morning there came a fellow to my cell whom I'd never seen before, and he called for me by name. And if I look back upon this scene with any regularity of conscience, I would say it was a cruel scene a caged animal. Anybody that had ever talked to me before, if I didn't like what they were saying, I would turn on my heel and leave, or at least have a stab or two at them. But when you're locked up in one of them close ones, you don't spin too far, I'll tell you. And I had to hear what he had to say. And he told me, about a society called Alcoholics Anonymous by telling me all about himself. And I often wondered why he came. This was the thing that boggled my mind. And he stood there as serene as a man you might well see and made the pitch on me. And I cut at him and I gouged at him and wanted to make him react. And you're probably looking at a man who's here today because that dummy stood still. I couldn't make him react. We found from our experience, he prefaced everything that he said. Let's be serious for a few minutes. I was three months or four months or five months in AA before I found out why he came. He didn't come to see me. He came for his own well-being. I'm going to read to you the first paragraph, chapter 7 in the book Alcoholics Anonymous, and it dispels the theory that we don't go to see alcoholics because they're alcoholics. We go to see alcoholics because we're alcoholics. Practical experience shows us that the surest immunity against drinking is intensive work with other alcoholics. Man, I want the sure way. The surest immunity against drinking is intensive work with other alcoholics. Then a promise. This works when all other activities fail. When your prayer group blows it, 
when your transcendental meditation group blows it, when your sitting and touching group blows it, this works when all other activities fail. And then he follows it with probably one of the shortest sentences in the book Alcoholics Anonymous that is followed by an exclamation mark. And it is so simple that we geniuses sometimes pass it by. Carry this message to the other alcoholics. Any of you cats need that one interpreted? And he came to perpetuate his own sobriety, and he didn't know Joe Lee from a bushel of monkeys. I just happened to be the lucky guy standing there. Because that was fixed in the lobby of the Mayflower Hotel in the year 1934, when Bill was in one of the worst state of minds that he'd ever been in. He was listening to the tinkling of the glasses and his mind was playing tricks on him. And then he panicked at what he was about to do. And he said these words that fixed the reason for us going to see alcoholics. Suddenly, I discovered that I needed him more than he needed me. That put the britches on us. Wonder what would have happened if he'd have went out on the sidewalk and sat down on the curb and said, I believe I'll wait till one comes along. None of us, believe me, none of us would be here tonight. And for a long time, each consecutive member of this society came in because they called on them cold. My sponsor did that, and thank God for it. I stand here today. If you dummies had waited for me to call you and roll over and bark to get into AA, I'd have had to die. I was that far in the shell. And I'm thankful that he read his lessons and read them well. I'm terribly glad. Not too long ago, we buried that fellow. And I had the honor of carrying a corner of that box and I began to count the fruits of this man's labors. All cold calls carrying that box. 174 years of sobriety was walking across that sidewalk because he had read his lessons and read them well. What is the transmittal of this message that we call? Some wise philosopher once said that it is a greater feat to jog the understanding than to jog the memory. We have the strongest thing here. I suspect that God in his wisdom keeps a lot of the mechanics of Alcoholics Anonymous undercover. For if we people, limited in our comprehension, could see what is happening here, I think it would blind us. You're supposed to do just what Jim said last night. Do it. And the rest of it will take care of itself. Under such auspices, I was so far in a shell I could not accept him. And I had to go back out some more. When my people found out that I would not accept the message, they hired two deputy sheriffs to load me into a police car and carry me 200 miles to Houston and put me on a train going west. This is what they euphemistically talk about in Al-Anon as releasing him with love. <laughs> They like to kill me, releasing me with love, you know. And I got off of that train in Los Angeles, and I couldn't walk, and 
Have you ever been like that? I'd set up shop in one of the toilets and uh, stayed on there. Some smart aleck said, we got to use this car again. It goes both ways. You can't live in it. And they sent a wheelchair out and took me. Clancy and I went down the other day and had a good look at that spot where they dumped me on the ground. And we both stood there for a minute. And with all the jocular remarks that I might make, all the levity, all the fun that we have in looking back at the ridiculous antics of a sick person like me, the next five months are beyond description. I drank like few people have and lived to tell the tale, and I ended up back under the bridge in Sacramento. Then I moved from there, I was, <laughs> the language that we use, I was beginning to up my living conditions and I moved from under the bridge to a flop house. <laughs> up yours too. <laughs> and one night in that flop house I got all of me I could stand. I had all of me that I could take. I discovered that there was nothing between me and me. I'd taken care of you a long time ago, but that night I had it with me. And I suppose that maybe I punched my ticket into this miracle of society. And it's not a very dramatic thing. I fell to the bed and said, God help me. And I suspect that is the ticket, that and nothing more. And I got up and walked out, and those of you who have been in that condition well know about willpower. And I walked the 2,600 miles back to find that fellow that had come to see me in jail. Now, wouldn't you love to have a pathetic story like that blown out of the saddle? When I was in AA three months, I discovered that there was a damned AA group three blocks from that damn flop house. <laughs> we're smart. Our, we're intelligent. We're keen-minded. I walked 2,600 miles when I could have walked three blocks, done her over. But I'm glad it's that way. It's my story. It's my experience, and I had it. And I went to AA. His story was the same, boy. He had it. And I never will forget my first AA meeting. I've had to compare every AA meeting with that one. And they shoved me up those old stairs that night. Years ago, they all, all were upstairs. I don't know why it was. And I'll never forget that meeting. Back in the back, was the old sheriff who had locked me up 20 years prior to that time, I guess, for felonious drunk driving. And here he sat there, he ain't sober two years, still got his pistols on, the very symbol of everything that I hated. He was known for brutality. He was a man, a very crude man. And he was known for bouncing prisoners off of the walls of his jail. He had a terrible reputation. And would you believe this man walked up to the front when the meeting was over and put his arm around me and said some words that boggled my mind. This crude old sheriff, he said, I love you, boy, and you can stay sober just like I do. Man, I can't describe what we find in this sharing of love in this society. Those people, I just hope that every one of you, those kids who raised their hands a while ago, I hope you get the same break I got. I hope the people that hug you to death have learned their lessons well and that you get the same break. I don't fear for this society. I don't think it. I think that if God intended for it to be here, it will be here as long as we keep it here. And there's nothing 
to me that can stand in the way of it. I'm not a scriptural man, but I remember at one time listening to a fellow talk somewhere in a church, and I'm not a church-going man, incidentally, but I have some keen ears for things that are good. And he told a story that came out of the scripture, and I've never forgotten it. It was about an old boy who was a lawyer, and his name was Gamaliel. He was kind of a neighborhood oracle around, and it seems that the people in those days depended upon Gamaliel's good advice. Anytime they had a problem, they would go sit with him, and he evidently would iron it out for him. And there seemed to have been at that time a group of people who had come into the community were doing things that were strange, and nobody quite understood what they were doing. And the people went to the Gamaliel and said to him, What shall we do about these people? And he sat and listened for a few minutes, and he said, It's like this. If what they do is not of the Lord, they will destroy themselves. If what they do is of the Lord, you cannot destroy them. Thank you very much.